of the Justice Committee. If you can do the needful through your electronic devices, uh, please uh, do so. Now is the appropriate time to declare any interest related to any items on the agenda, financial or otherwise. If not, then we will move on. We have no apologies. Um, if members are content, we will hansard the oral evidence sessions today that are taking place. Agreed. Um, joining us then by the Starley facility is Doug, Gemma, Emma, Rachel, uh, Linda and uh, Sinead. And there has been no delegation of uh, votes under the relevant standing order for today's meeting. Item two is the draft minutes of the meeting that was held on the 14th of January. And uh, if members are content that they're a true reflection of that meeting, uh, then I will sign them accordingly. Are members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Matters arising. Uh, a couple of items. Uh, during the oral evidence session with the Minister and the Perm Sec on Tuesday, there were several issues the Committee uh, may wish to follow up on. This included the further information on the behavioural analysis being considered by the Enforcement of COVID-19 Regulations Task Force when it is available and an update on the Troubles uh, Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme arrangements. So, uh, Members had also raised some questions relating to the terms of reference for the review into the operation of care and supervision units and the Police Service of Northern Ireland, at which the Minister indicated that Sajini would be, be best placed to place on record. So, if Members are content, the Committee will write uh, um, to the relevant uh, department and uh, also Sajini in respect of those issues that we wanted some further information in respect of. Um, the other item uh, was the draft budget 2021-22. The committee staff have been engaging with the department to arrange a briefing on the department's budget allocations following the draft budget of 21-22 announcement by the finance minister on Monday the 18th of January. Uh, information is also expected from the Committee for Finance on whether there will be a collective approach to scrutiny of the budget across statutory committees. So members will know that this is uh, a very difficult uh, budget position. Uh, the Committee then may wish to focus on gathering information on the implications of the draft budget on each of the Department's directorates, agencies and their uh, non-departmental public bodies to enable an assessment to be made of what priorities and adjustments, if any, the committee may wish to uh, consider and recommend. So, to help the assessment for the committee, um, if you are agreeable, we will write to the Policing Board and the PSNI for their views on the police budget, given that it accounts for a very significant proportion of the Department's justice budget. The committee uh, will also write to uh, the Department's eight NDPBs on the likely implications. Um, arising from the draft budget settlement. So, if members are content, let us uh, request the views of the Police Board, the PSNI and the NDPBs on the draft budget. We can ascertain that information and then the committee can give this issue further consideration in due course. Are members content with that approach? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, the letter then from the Minister of Justice on the Domestic Abuse Bill and the repercussive issue. Uh, is also a matter arising. The Minister has written outlining the key points of the opinion that she has received on the risk of repercussion in the legal aid schemes in other parts of the United Kingdom uh, and to the legal aid schemes in Northern Ireland as a result of the legal aid provisions in the Domestic Abuse Bill. Correspondence is at pages three to five of the table pack. So the Minister has outlined that the advice indicates that the risks of a successful Article 14 challenge to legal aid provision in England and Wales or Scotland because of the differential provision in Northern Ireland is low. Uh, this was the most important aspect of that legal advice that, which was sought as the risk of repercussion the other legal aid schemes carries with it uh, those potential cost consequences on uh, our involved jurisdiction. The Minister has also outlined that the opinion indicates that the risks of a successful challenge to current Northern Ireland legal aid schemes is low to medium and provides helpful advice regarding how the Department can seek to articulate the legitimate aim of the clause to assist in any defence of the provision. So, members, um, the Department has advised that work will continue to assess and quantify the repercussive risks across the Northern Ireland legal aid schemes, and officials are working on a plan to give effect to the legal aid provisions that are contained in the Bill. 
Uh, if members are agreeable, let us request an update on the ongoing due diligence work, which is referenced uh, in the letter um, in three months' time, and we will seek to have that update. Um, my own general view on this is that uh, I welcome that legal advice that the repercussive risks are low. Uh, I think that was a view that was held by many of us on the committee at the time. Uh, I regret the language that was used by the minister when she talked about the repercussive risks being uh, akin to RHI on steroids. Yes. It was wholly unacceptable that that language was used in the way that it was used, and now the department has had legal opinion uh, that I think justifies a lot of members' uh, concern at the way in which the department handled this. I know there's been documentation provided to members in terms of the various email exchanges that took place within the department in respect of this issue, which was uh, revelatory uh, in and of itself. Um, but uh, I hope lessons have been learned by the department by the way in which this was conducted uh, when the committee had been given this matter consideration. So uh, this, I hope, allows progress to be made for the appropriate clauses now to be uh, enacted. Uh, I'm not sure if members, uh, other members want to come in. Um, we have a slight technical problem, members, that are dialling in from Starleaf, and that our screen isn't showing me who is raising their hand and so on. So if you need to let us know, um, either through texting the committee clerk or through the Microsoft Teams function, um, if you're able to even just drop a note into that, either one, the committee clerk is busily um, trying to identify people that want to, to do that. So. Uh, we may get the technical glitch sorted out, and I'll be able to do that myself. But in the meantime, we will uh, persevere. So I think Rachel Woods has indicated wants to come in. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I just want to echo those um, comments with regard to the letter that was received today on the table pack. Um, certainly welcome um, the information in it, and also the the copies of the emails that were sent over to members last week. Um, I would very much welcome an update as soon as we can get one on the due diligence work and also any updated costings. Um, I would certainly welcome information on how the current waivers that are in place are handled in terms of legal challenge, given that this is not a new thing. We already have waivers for people that aren't in protected groups, such as forced marriage. So if the department are looking at that, I would certainly welcome some updated information. But just like yourself, Chair, I would like to echo your comments with regard to where we are and, and certainly welcome the, the letter that was sent by the Minister today. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll not go over that again, but it is just that I, I got great comfort in seeing what, what arrived in our inbox today. And I think the costings piece is something that I hope the department is on top of. I know um, we were talking about figures that seem very unrealistic at one period. So I think it is time now to knuckle down into the detail if we are to get serious about the commencement piece. And I think as a committee, we should follow this very closely. Thank you, Chair. Okay, agree. Okay, members, well, let's request an update then on that um, ongoing due diligence work, and then we will continue to keep a, a watching brief in respect of that. Members, content, we move on then to uh, agenda item four, which is the protection from the stocking bill. Um, so we have um, officials uh, coming to the committee to, to address us on this issue. Uh, as members know, the bill was introduced in the Assembly on the 18th of January. Uh, the relevant papers, including the bill and explanatory and financial memorandum, are pages 13 to 117 of your meeting pack. And uh, hopefully, joining us is uh, departmental officials in respect of this. So we should have uh, Brian, the deputy director of the Criminal Justice Policy Legislative Division, Andrew uh, Laverty, head of Criminal Law Branch, um, and uh, Barbara Comston. Uh, all from the Department of Justice, which this will be recorded by Hansard and a transcript published on the committee web page. So I think, Brian, I'm handing over to you at this stage. Uh, first of all, I should just change the chair that you can actually see and hear us okay. Mm. Um, we, we can hear you no problem. Um, so you, if, please feel free to continue. We can hear you. Oh, yes. We don't have a visual, but that's okay. We can hear you. Right. Okay, but then, Chair, I'm not sure what happened to the visual memoir. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I should thank the committee uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to brief you today on the principles of the protection from stalking bill. 
As you know, the bill passed its first stage in the Assembly on Monday. I'll give you a brief overview of the content and principles of the bill, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. The bill itself contains 20 clauses. It's divided into three parts. The first uh, creates a new specific offence of stalking. This will address behavioural acts associated with stalking, something that the current harassment law does not do effectively. While harassment often presents as a disagreement over a specific, a specific issue, stalking is, is fixated, obsessive, unwanted and repeated behaviour. The, the bill also creates the offence of threatening and abusive behaviour which can be triggered by a single incident. These new offences will also have stronger and more appropriate penalties and protections than are available under the current harassment legislation. You will note that the maximum penalty on summary conviction, that's, that's in a case going to the Magistrates Court, um, for the stalking offence is, is, will now be 12 months imprisonment or a fine up to the statutory maximum of £5,000 or both. The maximum penalty on conviction on indictment, that's for the more serious offences which go to the Crown Court, uh, is up to 10 years imprisonment or a fine or both. For the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, that's inappropriate behaviour which falls short of stalking, the maximum penalty on summary conviction is 12 months imprisonment or a fine up to £5,000 or both, and um, for indictment it's five years imprisonment or a fine or both. Importantly, the new offence of stalking will ensure compliance with the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. Uh, also known as the, the Istanbul Convention. This requires extraterritorial jurisdiction to be extended to the stalking offence. Under the legislation, where inappropriate stalking or behaviour occurs outside of the United Kingdom, it can constitute a stalking offence as, as if it occurred in Northern Ireland itself. <clears throat> Provision for special measures covering all victims of stalking is also included in the legislation. This will ensure that all victims of this insidious crime have automatic eligibility for special measure assistance, such as the use of live links or screens uh, at court when giving evidence. Moving on to the second part of the bill, uh, which relates to stalking protection orders, <clears throat> the bill provides for the introduction of these orders. Uh, they will be a key tool for police, enabling them to intervene prior to any conviction uh, where appropriate. Using them, the police can disrupt stalking behaviours before they become entrenched or escalate in severity. And through those, those orders, they can protect victims when, when there, there is an immediate risk to them. Police will apply these orders, taking the onus away from the victim, which I think is an important consideration. To make an application... Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. To make an, an application to the magistrate's court, a police officer must be satisfied that the defendant has carried out acts associated with stalking, that they pose a risk of stalking to another person, and that the order is necessary to protect that person, other person, from that risk. These orders will also be available to defendants under the age, uh, under the age of 18. Such applications will be heard, of course, in the youth court. The orders will be able to prohibit the defendant uh, from, ta uh, from taking identified actions as far as is necessary to protect the other person from the risk of being subject to stalking behaviour. They could, for example, include prohibiting the defendant from entering certain locations or defined areas uh, where the, the victim resides or frequently visits. An order could also prohibit, prohibit contacting the victim by any means, including via telephone, post, email, text messages, social media, or, or indeed physically approaching the victim at all or within a specified um, distance. In addition, in addition to pro prohibitions, an order can require the defender to do something as far as is necessary to protect the other person from stalking. Positive requirements could include the defendant attending a, a perpetrator intervention programme or undergoing a mental health assessment. If the defendant breaches the terms of an order, the maximum penalty on summary conviction is six months imprisonment or a fine up to, up to £5,000 or both. 
Uh, on indictment, the penalty will be up to five years imprisonment or a fine or both. A defendant is subject to a stalking prevention order. A defendant subject to a stalking prevention order will, will be subject to, to notification requirements uh, and will need to provide personal details, their full name and home address, to the police before the end of three days, beginning with the date the order comes into force. They must also provide details of any change of address, also within three days. Failure to comply with the notification requirements without reasonable excuse, or knowingly to provide the police with false information, uh, will be an offence. It will be for the court to decide what constitutes a reasonable excuse in such cases. The maximum penalty on summary conviction for, uh, for notification offences is six months imprisonment uh, or a fine up to £5,000 or both. And on indictment, it's five years imprisonment or a fine or both. Um, moving on to the last part of the bill, this provides um, uh, prize that, we, that the department will issue and publish guidance to the chief constable about the exercise of police functions in relation to stalking protection orders. Uh, we envisage that the statutory guidance will provide information about the procedure to, to, for applying for a stalking prevention order, as well as providing the police with a practical toolkit to use when making such applications. And that concludes my opening remarks. Um, 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 uh, uh, my team and I will be very happy now to ask any questions that you may have on the principles of the bill. Uh, we look forward to working with you in, in the coming weeks and months as the bill progresses through the Assembly. Many thanks. Okay, thank, thank you, Brian. That's helpful. Um, just a, a couple of quick questions for me, and then I'll bring in Linda Dillon and Paul Free. And, um, in terms of the offence, um, this bill, unlike the domestic abuse bill, um, lists behaviours, um, and I suppose I'm just wanting a little bit more information around the the thinking behind that uh, in terms of specifying the type of behaviours um, as to, to why that approach has been taken rather than the creation of a general offence. <coughs> Um, I'll, I'll start this off, and I may pass it to one of my colleagues. Uh, we, in developing this bill, we had quite a lot of engagement with um, uh, an expert group bringing together the Susie Lamplew Trust, uh, Women's Aid, and a number of other NGOs who had direct experience of this. We also spoke to our colleagues, both in, in England and Wales and in Scotland, and actually took advice from them about actually how their systems, uh, both of them, both um, jurisdictions, already have stalking legislation. We took advice from them about how their, 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 their legislation was working. So it was really from that, certainly from victims, uh, the importance of actually having a stalking as, as a defined offence was actually highlighted. And certainly, actually, uh, I think it was recognised that, in fact, quite often some of the, some of the elements of stalking aren't re aren't, haven't historically been readily identified and recognised by police services, uh, either here or in the UK. So I think it was for that reason that put, uh, having a list of typical behaviours, which is fairly comprehensive, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's covering all possible behaviours. The aim of that was really to actually help and make sure that, in fact, that stalking was actually identified and recognised more readily. Uh, part, partially because, of course, uh, some of the actions in themselves look quite innocent, but when, you, when they actually, you see them in the context of it being obsessive, repeated, unwanted, and uh, uh, behaviour, I think it, <coughs> it was that. Uh, and repeated behaviour. It was that those sort of patterns which were important. So uh, we felt it was important to specify, set out those, those behaviours in, in the legislation to, to, to assist to ensure that, that, that they were appropriately recognised. I don't know if my colleagues want to add to that. Um, Chair, it's Andrew Laverty speaking. What I might add, um, which I hope would add some clarity, is that the, the <coughs> reason for setting out uh, a not exhaustive but a, a fairly comprehensive list of behaviours was to draw a distinction between what might be constituted as harassment behaviour and what we want to have clearly identified as stalking behaviours moving forward. Um, that was a, a big part of the responses to the department's consultation um, as part of a review of the existing harassment laws dating back to the last mandate. Uh, so perhaps that, that adds just a little bit of extra clarity uh, to, to what Brian has said. Okay, and the, the number of incidents 
constitute an offence, as, as, as I think said it too. Um, what was the, the rationale in terms of striking that at, at two being the figure? I think, again, we, took, we looked to see what was happening in other jurisdictions, and certainly we took a lot of our model, what we're doing here is based around the, the Scottish model, which I think certainly the NGOs um, uh, prefer to actually the approach in England. Um, the two, number two was really about actually starting to establish a pattern. Uh, in practical terms, in fact, um, it may well be um, you know, uh, the capacity of our system, of the police or others to necessarily pick up the second offence as being the, the, um, as being the point at which they come in uh, will depend on how their systems work. But in fact, we felt it was important to actually to see the establishment of the beginning of a pattern. Uh, to have a one offence could still be a, a single uh, offence could still or single incident could still actually be core, but it wouldn't be itself stalking. But if it's two or more offences, then you're starting to create a pattern and you're starting to see stalking occur. Uh, and, and certainly it was very much taking advice what's happening elsewhere and how, the, how it was defined that two seemed to be the right number. Uh, Chair, if I could just add to that as well, uh, the two number isn't something which is new uh, in the stalking sphere. Uh, the instances of or two instances or more actually already exists in the protection from harassment order. So it, it does have a, a legislative footing in Northern Ireland already. What we've done is, is extract that from the harassment legislation and, and included it in the stalking legislation. Okay. Um, I have a few more, but I'm going to bring in Linda uh, in the first instance, and I may pick up again once other members have had an opportunity. So Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, and just to thank the officials for coming to the committee today in relation to this issue. Obviously, we were well aware of the, the impact of stalking and the long-lasting and negative effects that it has on a victim, on somebody who is um, being pursued in this manner. And I mean, it, it's, it's regrettable that we haven't had legislation in place today, however, on to date rather. However, I am, I'm, I'm really happy to see it come into the, come into the fore now, and I think that particularly given that we have just completed the domestic abuse bill and while stalking is certainly not and, and there's there's a very good reason why it wasn't included in the domestic abuse bill it, it is generally not domestic there certainly are incidences and cases where stalking forms part of of domestic abuse so i, th I think it is really important that, that we've got to this point and that we're we're moving forward with this and um, just a, a few questions in terms of the consultation and many of the respondents said that their complaints hadn't been taken seriously and the police didn't understand the difference between stalking and harassment behaviours. So obviously in the domestic abuse bill you would be well aware that the, there was a big emphasis around training and I think that that needs to be the case again in relation to this bill and I would foresee the, the committee having some conversations around how we ensure that happens and whether that needs to be actually on the face of the bill, but th those will be conversations we, we will have as a committee. But I do think it's important that issue around training. And then I suppose, have you any plans around a campaign to the, to the public element of it to ensure that the wider public out there understand what stalking is and understand what stalking behaviours are, and so that people who are potentially the victims of it understand what it is and that they actually can access the law in a way that will will satisfactorily deal with what they're what's happening to them. But they need to understand that what's happening to them is stalking. So I do think there needs to be a publicity and a, awareness raising element around this. So I suppose just to ask you, can you highlight around both of those issues, the training issue and the issue around the, that public element of it or the advertising kind of campaign? I'm happy to answer those questions. Certainly on the first one about training, uh, we have been having continuing conversations with the police over the last two years about, about this. Uh, I indeed went to the Hampshire um, Clinic, which is one of the exemplars in England about how you deal with stalking. I went to, to it with two, two colleagues from the police service. Um, we actually both saw how it's working in practice and talked to police and other interests there about how, it, how their, their system was working. So the police have been quite engaged with us as we've been developing the legislation. And indeed, um, 
Uh, they've been, they also sat on that expert group, which was looking at how we total this forward. Um, so we had, we, as part of that, we, we all recognized the importance of training. I think it was recognized, in fact, too often, particularly stalking offenses fall between stalks insofar as identifying the pattern quite early on is important. And, and, and certainly I know the police felt frustrated at the existing legislation. They found problems with using harassment legislation in some of the cases which came before them. So, you know, I think the legislation will both give them greater capacity to intervene effectively, but also, in fact, it's, we, we clearly do have it, and they will have a significant training need because clearly bringing in new stalking protection orders, they'll be new. So obviously they have to be, that's going to have to be rolled out, the awareness and understanding about how they'll work. The police will also have to actually, obviously, of course, their brief there, and train their start their their officers to make sure that they understand the new the new law and how it how it's to be applied. So clearly, we will be working with them over and over the period the next period to do that. Uh, and certainly, I know I met the police uh, with the police and um, um, a, a trainer who had been doing, involved in doing some training work on stalking in two of the police services in England last week uh, to discuss this. And I'm meeting the police again in a fortnight. Just um, to take those conversations forward. So um, I th I, at this stage, they're still under development, but in fact, it's well recognized the importance of training as they do in domestic abuse as well. And indeed, in fact, you know, one of the discussions was whether we could even tag some of the training into the domestic abuse training and add it on. Because whereas, I think you're quite right, it's not just about domestic, it's much broader than the domestic abuse. So some components of stalking do, do have links to domestic abuse, you know, about offenses, formal relationships. So there may well be capacity, you know, an issue there about whether we even link some of the training into that, that, that domestic abuse training as well. But that, that's under discussion and certainly it will be taken forward. On campaigning for the public, I think as with all legislation, as we move, as the legislation moves forward, we will be developing plans to see how we actually can roll it out because clearly the awareness issue will be very important. So um, we, we haven't got hard plans yet, those, those will still be under development, but in fact, by the time the, the, we move move ahead, we will be actually developing a, a communication strategy, which will both actually um, have some public component, but also be focused on the police, uh, public protection, and um, PPS, and indeed the NGOs and others who will actually themselves be working with us to actually make sure that that, uh, that um, awareness of the law is actually promulgated effectively. Um, Linda, if, if I might jump in very quickly just to add something to what Brian said, it's Andrew Laverty speaking. Um, I think one of, one of the things that um, we and, and I in particular have found very helpful is uh, in understanding the difference between harassment and stalking. Uh, there's an acronym which was devised by the College of Policing and it's been used in guidance to the police and, and it's one that that we'll certainly take the opportunity to rehearse as many times as we possibly can using the department's social media platform. Um, and it's it's very similar to the, the FAST acronym for stroke awareness. In stalking, uh, the acronym is FOUR, F-O-U-R. And as I said, the, the difference between harassment and stalking is that harassment's primarily seen as a dispute or a grievance mm -hmm. issue where if that grievance issue is addressed, then the harassment behaviour is expected to diminish. But with stalking and using the FOUR acronym, what you're looking at is behaviour that is fixated, obsessive, unwanted and repeated. And I think that that's a message which lends itself very well to a social media platform um, and awareness raising on, on that basis. Uh, thank you, Adin. I might just add that uh, on the training, we're also not starting from a bad place because uh, <clears throat> workers, we, though we are behind the rest of the UK in, uh, uh, in terms of actually bringing this into legislation, uh, the College of, of Police nationally has actually developed very good guidance on, on stalking um, in the meantime. And indeed, we did run a workshop about a year, 18 months ago, where we brought some members from, from the college over uh, together with the uh, City Lamplew Trust and, and others, and we had a, quite a useful seminar bringing together a lot of the interests, um, police and, um, and community interests, 
um, and actually we, uh, get, getting in details about that, about the, what sports develop nationally in way, by way of training. So we're starting off with quite a good resource available nationally, which we can draw on, and I, and I know the police are linked into that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask those questions and I have to say I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're linking in in relation to um, both the firm and, and the advertising campaigns with the NGOs because obviously they are the people who have the experience of this and, and would best know how to reach people and have the greatest understanding of of what the issues are and, and how they impact people. So, and, and again, that acronym, you're absolutely right, is, is something that lends itself very well to social media and I would encourage the members of the committee certainly and, and other elected reps to to be part of of getting that out there and ensuring that people understand exactly what um stocking looks like. So thank you for the answers. That, that those were all my questions for now, Chair. Great. Thank you, Linda. Paul Free. Thank you. And, and Linda has addressed uh, one of the issues that I had and that was that for many years for many years, when we as politicians were pushing for a stocking legislation, legislative piece, that the department would always say, well, look, we're covered with harassment. And my first question was going to be, can you please tell me the difference now between harassment and stalking? And you've quite rightly answered that by using that acronym, uh, which I'm aware of. So uh, thank you for that, because you've hit that nail on the head. Uh, I suppose the questions then I have is, uh, and let me first of all say I welcome this bill and I welcome the uh, creation of an offence of stalking. Uh, I'm there with you 100%. I was there five years ago, uh, so I'm quite, very supportive of this. But I suppose it's the concept around the reasonableness that we did touch on in the last in the uh, domestic violence piece. Uh, but what's interesting about this bill is is that it's 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 uh, it's it's much more strict the strict the Descriptive, sorry, descriptive, compared to the domestic violence piece, in that it outlines conduct, and not only does it outline conduct, but actually one of the subsections is the reasonableness test, acting in another way that a reasonable person or a reasonable person who has any particular <coughs> knowledge of B that A has would expect would cause B to suffer fear, alarm, and substantial distress. I suppose the question is. Why, why is that reasonable test a subsection and not an umbrella reasonableness test for all conduct? Right. Um, well, at one level it could be, but in fact, I, one option would have been, of course, just to have that as the total test. Just in fact, you know, would the man on the Clapham omnibus see this as actually reasonable or not? Uh, I think what we did, though, as we noted from victims, that their concern was quite often actually they're quite innocuous uh, behaviours, which in themselves don't look like, you know, the fact that you're uh, a potentially vulnerable woman is someone selling her flowers every day. You know, as a man in the street, that might be rather quirky or strange, slightly strange behaviour, but it wouldn't necessarily be seen as threatening or abusive. But in fact, that sort of obsessive, repeated, um, fixated sort of unwanted behaviour could actually over time actually really become quite sinister and actually be quite you know, quite disruptive and actually damaging to the individual on the receiving end. So we felt it was important because of the nature of stalking to try to spell out some of the typical behaviours that could co constitute it. But at the same time, just as I suppose in the, the, the domestic abuse side, you know, it's very hard to specify. Once you, any time you ever write a list, you always will leave something off it. So I think we felt we wanted to spell out what are often the typical behaviours, but by putting in that, te that re test of reasonableness at the end, that would ensure that if somebody found a new novel sort of way of, of stalking or, 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 or um, uh, obsessing over an individual, that that, that wouldn't actually be left, wouldn't, wouldn't be discounted because it wasn't on the list. Yeah, okay. Now, I do see on page one that uh, clause one B, Two is it has a reasonable person test also. So I suspect, with regards to the actual offensive stalking, that covers probably all the other items of conduct too. Would that be correct in what I'm saying? By definition, you know, the test of reasons would cover them all. But I think we felt it was important. Indeed, we were advised by victims. 
that it was important that, in fact, you did actually spell this out because quite often um, some of the behaviours in themselves look quite innocuous and actually therefore may, may be discounted by perhaps a policeman or another uh, person in the justice system who was less familiar with stalking. Yep. And I also noticed then you have a, a reasonable defence. So how, how do you see that reacting or how do you see that how do you see those two reasonableness tests living alongside each other? The 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 reasonableness test for the offence and then a reasonable test for defence? Well I think it Essentially, in fact, the test of reasonableness is to actually try to identify whether an offence is com committed. Now, there, there can well be, of course, and it, uh, on occasions it could well be that a, a, a pattern of behaviour could be there for some good reason, which won't, wouldn't be apparent from a test of reasonableness, but when you actually actually inquiry the, the, uh, the person who appeared to be committing a potential offence, they could explain that there were some other factors which made that what was looked like a pattern of uh, inappropriate behaviour actually legitimate. So, in fact, I think in essence we recognise, you know, this is by definition, this stalking is quite a difficult area. Um, and the, we, what it's important both that we recognise that people will develop new and inter interesting ways of uh, undertaking stalking behaviour, but also because it can be so, so uh, wide ranging. It's possible where you could sweep up some innocent activities as well. So, in fact, I think that what we're doing is actually providing a safeguard to ensure that if someone is going about their legitimate purposes with no intention of stalking, but creates a pattern of behaviour which looks like it could have been conducted by a stalker, if, if they've got reasonable excuse for that behaviour which shows it isn't a defence, then of course it won't be prosecuted or, or pursued. Yes. And, and, and to get and, and one of those examples, I suppose, of what you're outlining is the subsection F, four uh, F, which is loitering in any place, whether private or whether public or private. Sorry. So there you again, you, there you can have a quite innocent aspect of somebody just having a presence somewhere, whether it be a routine, whether it be their job, whether it be their hobbies. They're they're there for a particular reason, but because they are a stalker. They are striking fear into their victim because they are there. Uh, I suppose, that, and that's, that's what we're gra gra grappling with here. Why do you need this necessity of putting in whether public or private in brackets? Why, 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 why is loitering in any place not good enough? Sorry. Uh, Randy, do you want to pick that one up? Well, there must be, it's actually, I understand what you're saying. Any place will include public and private, but um, I think it's probably us trying to be, be, be as specific as we could be to, uh, to make sure we weren't uh, um, well, anything I, I think, Chair, what, what I might do, it's, it's Andrew Lafferty speaking, um, just go back slightly and say that one of the, one of the reasonable defences may be someone who's involved in a neighbourhood watch programme yes. or someone who, someone who walks their dog that isn't necessarily visible if it's a small dog or um, because the person's only seen from waist height um, if they're behind a wall walking past a person's premises or something like that. Yeah, Those true. are instances that, that, that you could describe as, as a reasonable defence. But uh, in terms of the, the public or private, um, what I would like to do, uh, Mr. Free, with, with your, your blessing, is go back and look at the exchanges that we would have had with the Office of Legislative Council to, to provide you with complete clarity around why we've specified both, because what I would say, having been involved in, in the preparation of quite a number of pieces of substantial legislation over the course of the, the last number of years, if it's there, it's there for very good reason. Yeah, sure. um, but but the, the drafting of the legislation has taken place over the course of the last 78 months. And the, the reason for that particular inclusion escapes my memory at the moment. So I, I would like to go back and make sure that any thoughts that I have are confirmed by uh, making sure that any exchanges yeah. we had with that's, office legislation. That's sure. And, and to go back to your last point, that's the point I make because, and you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there too, so not to cast aspersions or generalisms, but you could have a neighbourhood watch volunteer and a dog walker who are stalkers. So... So, so and, that's why I'm asking. They wouldn't be stalkers. They would be undertaking. They would be carrying out um, behaviours which could could be stalking. 
And ultimately, ultimately, in fairness, it's quite often where, from, certainly from talking to victims of stalking, quite often where you're finding that there is a person loitering around the house. This isn't just about the loitering, it's also that they leave things, they actually go onto social media. Usually it's quite, it, it, it's unusual that you just have loit that loitering and nothing else. Yes. But at the same time, you could have a circumstance where someone could be appearing very frequently and at a certain point the individual who feels they are being stalked could pick up the wrong conclusion from it. Uh, and it, it might turn out in practice there was a legitimate reason, in which case, to be honest, if the person knew that, they'd be reassured and probably wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be a problem. Yes. Uh, on, on 4D, monitoring the use by B or any other person of the internet, email or any other form of electronic communication, how will we ever prove that someone is dipping in and out of your social media uh, posts? Well, again, from talking to victims, usually because, in fact, it, that usually tends to be the thin end of the wedge. They start off by actually looking at what they what they have in their social media. They then reproduce it and uh, distort it and reissue it. So, you know, it's quite often that's often quite the entry point. They start off by doing that, but then actually the evidence comes from the fact you find something which they have put innocently on their social media to what they think is a group of friends or whatever suddenly reappears in a distorted fashion or implying behaviours or other things which are quite quite uh, uh, quite um, quite fraudulent or uh, uh, certainly weren't, weren't weren't true. So um, I think in fact this is about people accessing the information really uh, with a, for a purpose, for a particular purpose in, in, in stalking. And, um, and just my final question, Chair. The, the two offences that you create in Section 1, one is the offence of stalking and the other is the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour. Now, I think we all can recognise very quickly uh, what is uh, threatening or abusive behaviour, probably more so than stalking and, and to the untrained eye, very much so. But why does that come? Why does the offence of the threatening or abusive behaviour uh, which to me is the manifestation of stalking to many agree many degrees. Why is that a lesser sentence on conviction on indictment? It's only five years, whereas stalking is ten. I think because the stalk in the stalking, what you're seeing is a pattern of behaviour, which in fact therefore is seen as being more damaging, more serious. The, on the threatening and abusive behaviour, sometimes it may go on to being stalking, but it could well be it's a situation where. You, you, haven't, you can't demonstrate that, in fact, there's actually been you know, a continuing pattern of behaviour, but at the same time, you can certainly demonstrate that, um, that the threatening and abusive behaviour. So that itself can, can get, a, get a, a sentence. But clearly, if it went on, or if a pattern could be established, uh, then, in fact, that, that's potentially more serious. A one-off threat or, uh, um, is, is, is clearly uh, an offence. But clearly, if that one-off threat then, then became a pattern of offending, and that is, more, is potentially more damaging, hence the, 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 the larger sentence. So do we, not have, so do we not have offences for threatening or abusive behaviour? We do, but in, in putting in a, a, a particular offence of threatening or, or abusive behaviour in the Protection from Stalking Bill, what we're saying is that that the threshold for a conviction there can relate to a single instance. Um, it's threatening or abusive behaviour under uh, the other legislation, Offence Against the Persons Act. Yes. Um, what we're trying to do is corral as many stalking type behaviours into a single piece of legislation rather than relying on disparate pieces of legislation. Uh, where a person may try and use other defences that aren't specified or the, the likes of the reasonableness person test, that exists in this legislation. But to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't exist as a defence in the Offences Against the Person Act. In the Offences so, Against the Person Act, what's the tariffs there for abusive behaviour? That's something I, I don't know just off the top of my head, uh, Mr Free. It's something that we can't confirm for you, though. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your question or your answers. Thank you. Okay. Paul, um, can I bring in Emma Rogan, please? Uh, see, I think she's on mute. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Emma, you're on mute. 
Emma, if you can try on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear me now. Out. Yep. Thanks, Chair, and, and again, thanks to the, the officials for your presentation um, this afternoon. I have a couple of questions, just mine's in relation to, um, can we have a breakdown of the gender makeup um, of the stalking victims? Uh, my second question is, um, a lot of the consultees and the stakeholders that, that fed into the consultation have called for um, the establishment of a stalking register. Um, has consideration been given to this and what would that register look like and how would it be um, be used? Okay, <clears throat> well, two questions. First of all, uh, to, uh, the gender breakdown. But the reality is, I don't know we've got good, <clears throat> we've got good, um, we've got good statistics, a good uh, intelligence on stalking. I think certainly from uh, what speaking to the police and to victims groups, you know, our expectation is the vast majority of, of people who are stalked are actually female. Although there is a, a, there is a minority of males who also actually experience this, and it's equally serious regardless of, <clears throat> of the gender of, of the person in, um, receiving the behaviour. Um, part of our problem is actually, sort of, at the moment, um, it come, these, this sort of behaviour comes under harassment and other legislation. Um, victims will tell us it's not picked up effectively as well. So I, I don't know we have a particularly good picture at this, at this moment, though I think once the legislation comes in, we'll get a progressively better picture, of, I, I believe, particularly if you know, people use the law. <clears throat> on the um, on a um, stalk, stalking register, um, I, um, it's, we had lots of conversations with the NGOs, including City Lamp, Free Trust and others, and um, we also spoke to the police and others, um, both in, in other jurisdictions. And by and large, in fact, this was not an issue which was brought to us. You know, we actually went to the victims groups and others to say, what do we need to put in this? And, we're, and where we were, and we didn't get a significant demands for a stalking register. Um, certainly talking to the police, <coughs> registers themselves um, um, are we're not sure how effective they are. Certainly when it comes to someone, if they are actually being picked up by the police as a potential stalker, uh, the, the criminal record viewer, could be the main mechanism. Um, we actually have a system in Northern Ireland. We are fortunate that we have we have one police service, <clears throat> and indeed actually one of most of our organisations. It means that we're, whereas in England we have 43 police services, you'll find stalkers quite easily become lost by moving from one area to another because they suddenly move out of the books of one, one force and onto, into another force which doesn't have access to those records. Uh, we share all our, our records of that nature um, between the police, public prosecutions, the courts, and other, and other justice agencies. It means that where someone is actually uh, on the books for stalking, or they're actually be, um, being arrested, or indeed actually being cautioned, or whatever, they are actually in the system. And once we have a stalking le legislation, they will be in the system, and our and causeway will register this as a stalking offence. So the police will find it relatively easy if, in fact, someone's name comes up in our area just by looking to their past record. They will they will immediately see there's a stalk that there's a stalking you know, conviction or or a case against them. So I'm not I'm not I, I'm certainly we're not turning our face against this. And it's just, it hasn't been raised with us as a significant issue. I think Northern Ireland, because of its structure and makeup, it probably. Uh, our current system should work sort of well enough as they stand once we have a, a new offence. Uh, and certainly that, 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 I think, is the police's view at the moment. But what I would say is, in fact, <clears throat> our aim would be to keep this under review. And if, in fact, there was any advantage which could be obtained from that, then we would take it forward. I would perhaps just finish off by noting that, in fact, certainly talking to colleagues in other jurisdictions, I'm not aware of any, any real pressure in those areas for a stalking register, and certainly there are no plans elsewhere to, to introduce one. So, um, so it's one it's sort of an issue which I, I think we would keep a watching brief on. And if, in fact, it looked like something like that could, could actually give value, well, I think certainly we wouldn't, we wouldn't be backward in, in, in seeking, to, seeking to introduce it. But as it stands, uh, I, I'm not clear it would actually add any value other than a bit of additional bureaucracy. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you, Emma. Can I bring uh, Gemma in then at this stage? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks to Brian and Andrew for your presentation. Um, I want to ask a, a couple of questions around the stock and protection orders. 
Um, first of all, can you give a practical example or examples of um, what a stalker protection order would entail? Uh, what we do, Jim, with, uh, with your agreement is bring in our Barbara Comston, uh, who is the, our policy lead on stalking, uh, and work very closely with the Office of Legislative Council on the, the drafting of these provisions. Uh, so, Barbara, if you wanted to offer some advice. Um, well, a, a stalking protection order um, can have prohibitions. Um, it could actually ask the, the defendant to prohibit them from visiting um, a certain area where their victim um, lives. Um, it can also ask them or require them prohibitions and requirements, which means they could be asked to go for a mental health assessment or to attend a, a perpetrator programme. So the, those are the two aspects of the stalking protection order. Um, the thing that has that welcomed, and in, even in our consultation, a lot of respondees were very keen to see the stalking protection orders introduced because they will take the onus away from the victim and um, were under the protection from harassment. As a victim, you would have to apply for your own non-molestation order yeah. or you have to wait for a conviction of harassment to have a restraining order where the stalking protection order will put the onus on the police and once they are happy and content that stalking has actually been committed, that acts have occurred, they can apply then to the court for a stalking protection order with immediate effect. Okay, thank you Barbara, that's that's really good. Um, are there stock and protection orders in other jurisdictions? Um, England and Wales introduced stock and protection orders at the start of January last year, so they've, they've just actually come up to their year, um, and they are completing a full year's review. We've been working very closely with our colleagues in the Home Office, our um, stock and policy leads there. Um, on the whole, they've found um, the stock and protection orders, they've been welcomed and they are working, but obviously as Brian and Andrew have mentioned, in England and Wales they've got 43 different constabularies, so the take up of stock and protection orders differs from one constabulary to the next. I think because we all have one force here um, and with the appropriate training on how to use the pr protection orders, um, that they'll, they'll certainly be welcomed. I think, yeah. Gemma, it's, it's Andrew speaking. If, if I might just add a couple of points to, to what uh, Barbara is saying, I think the part of the, the big attraction of the stock and protection orders, and, and it links back um, a little to what Emma was talking about around the, the calls for a stocking register. We see the stock of protection orders as something which are there at an early stage. Um, it's a proactive uh, disposal. It's not dependent upon a conviction for stalking having taken place. Um, they're applied for by the police, so there's instant protections. And I think part of what um, respondents to your consultation exercise rehearsed were frustrations with people breaching non-molestation or restraining orders almost with impunity. And we've gone to, to great lengths to, to make sure that there's a standalone offence of breaching stalking protection orders, uh, which gives these orders much more teeth. And there are quite significant penalties which are available there for breaching them. Um, certainly in the Crown Court, it's it's a, a potential imprisonment sentence of, of up to five years, <coughs> excuse me, and six months on summary conviction. So we we believe that there, there's something which are going to offer instant protections and um, as Brian has alluded to earlier and as Barbara has, has mentioned, we have a singular police force here, so we expect that uh, implementation and application of, of these powers are, are going to be consistent across um, all of the, the district command areas. I think certainly from, <clears throat> I think from a justice perspective, the value of these orders is they actually are, they can, they are, they can be brought in, as Andy said, very early on 
Uh, and the, the aim is to disrupt the behavior. You know, we're talking about stalkers who often actually are quite obsessive and their behavior escalates. You know, the ability to disrupt that behavior fairly early on and either actually limit their the, the sort of behavior or indeed actually sort of have the individual sent off to, for actually assessment or in fact um, some sort of ther therapeutic support if in fact that would be part of a solution. You know, gives us a lot, a lot better opportunities to, to, to actually sort of address stalking. Our aim is really to try to intervene early where we can to actually essentially limit the damage done rather than it, allowing it to become established behavior, which is much more difficult to actually sort of uh, uh, to disrupt later. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think um, the earlier you can uh, stop it, the better. My final question is, um, in the bill or in the explanatory notes, it's a, under rural needs assessment. It states that we do consider that specific action may be required to raise awareness in rural areas. Um, obviously, I'm from a very rural area and I have my own ideas of how that would be a challenge um, for victims of stalking. But can you outline or do you know what that specific awareness raising might look like? I think um, I really don't. Well, yeah, you, um, you want to say something first of all? I think a public campaign is something that we will definitely be working on um, as the bill makes its way through the Assembly. Um, we have already engaged with the Susie Lamplew Trust and they have set up and um, established a Northern Ireland Stalking Consortium, which will include a lot of the NGO groups from Women's Aid, Victim Support, uh, the Probation Board as well. We'll also have a representative from PSNI and the Public Prosecution Service on that consortium. So they will be able to be a one-stop shop um, in raising the profile and raising that campaign across Northern Ireland that everybody can understand what behaviours constitute stalking and it will be part of a, a public awareness campaign. Um, clearly, if, Thank if, you, that's Grant. That's my um, questions. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Sinead Bradley, and then um, Rachel Woods is last, but by no means least. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation so far. I suppose I'll just run through quickly um, three things I want to clarify. Am I right to say that it, you have gone with the approach that there should be no set time between instances when determining behaviour. So this doesn't have to reoccur within six days, six weeks, six months. That's, or... that's, that's correct, yes. Okay, okay. I just couldn't see anything in there on that. Um, so I, I see how we've tried to make the distinction between harassment and stalking, and, and there is that other option of um, going down harassment route. But what I'm struggling with in my mind here, as I read through the bill as presented, the distinction between online trolling and stalking, and when I work my way through the tests for a conviction, um, could you advise, would it be possible under this legislation for a successful conviction to be carried out based on exclusively online behaviour? Um, I think the answer should be yes, um, because essentially what you're looking for is a pattern behaviour. If it's actually, it is, you know, if, if it fits the criteria, which it, it would do. Uh, and I know speaking to victims, <clears throat> I've had I've certainly contacts from a number of victims who have been largely actually stalked online, where in fact, you know, it's both about um, there are people then there um, in one case there um, the person in the, um, actually sort of lifted stuff from their online site and then used it in their place of employment to suggest the person uh, was a sex offender you know so they so they actually you they were only working online but they were interfering with the person's actually online um, identity they were actually putting out false and malicious um, statements about them online uh, that would clearly be stalking behaviour, and I think certainly would would, would fit into the, our definition uh, without any problem. Um, but I, that's, you, yeah. that's right, isn't it? I think if I could just add, um, during our policy development, and we spoke to many of the different advocacy services, um, and they have 
recorded that police will have to look at all online stalking as well and it has should be taken um, towards that investigation for an offence so it will need to include online stalking and offline that, that will build the case so that will that will also come as part of the training program okay thank you so yes yeah, so there it may there may be a case that has an element of online and offline but there there could be a conviction based on what we know to date as being trolling is a form of stalking and a conviction based on that and um, so so based on that i would just add a caveat one of the dilemmas with the online side is where people actually use false identities whatever well, no, well, so that's it's, uh, yeah. i'm not pretending it is always going to be straightforward and easy but at yeah. the same time that, you know certainly it would be covered by the legislation okay so that brings me nicely then on to my third um question or point i want to raise with you so Given, yes, the anonymous accounts or uh, false identities used online, one of the parts of the consultation you talked about was the power um, to search to premises, the power of entry to search premises for evidence in such an instance. Um, and I just wondered where had that landed or is, that, is there plans to incorporate that um, to, to give, I suppose, a route to conviction via any online stalking? Well, those, those would be standard investigatory powers under case legislation. And we, we don't need to add in that aspect to the stalking legislation. Um, you know, the, the police will have access to, if, if they, they clearly have the ability to um, identify people um, who already under the Malicious Communications Act, they can identify people using pseudonyms or, or false identities. And when those people are identified, existing case legislation allows for examination of, of mobile devices or uh, laptops or computers, that type of, that type of um, uh, resource that a person will use to, to, to carry out online stalking or online only stalking. Okay, I just, I just I do note that um, from the consultation, you know, that part of entry, and, and it did raise an important point that the, the person being stopped might not be fully aware of the entirety of the perpetrator's actual behaviours and mm -hmm. such, um, you know, such gathering stuff, such evidence can actually bring to light uh, further things like surveillance and tracking and bugging that had been happened that the perpetrator wouldn't have necessarily been aware of. And and I know you did speak to it, and I just wasn't sure if there was something else um, running in tandem with this legislation against the legislative program to specifically look at that, but there, there appears not to be. Is that fair? No, it's, in essence, in fact, this is a criminal act. And in fact, we've, the fact that it can go to, to the Crown Court on an indictment is it's clearly a serious criminal offence. The police have quite extensive powers under PACE to actually pursue investigations, and they would do that. And you're quite right, it, it could well be <clears throat> that uh, um, the stalker doesn't always know uh, the full extent of the stalking. I know um, I was sitting with a minister who was talking to a, a, a victim of stalking and her mother uh, a few months ago, and the woman was telling, telling the minister that um, she discovered through, because she was living in um, accommodation which had um, some surveillance cameras as part of its the, 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 um, the building security. <clears throat> and it came to light that the, the, her stalker, uh, who was, I think, a former, a former um, had out there in a relationship previously, had a key to the building and, and was identified as having visited and stood outside her door on a hundred occasions uh, over a, a three or four month period. And she actually knew, knew nothing about that, but other things he was doing clearly were actually she was seeing. So we you know you're quite right. Once actually they, they exercise their powers under place, the police could well find uh, evidence which wouldn't be wouldn't be available or known to the to the stalk, stalking victim. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, Rachel Woods. 
thank you, um, thank you, Chair, and thank you um, uh, to the officials for coming today. Uh, a lot of my questions have been asked, but just to pick up on uh, Sinead Bradley's point there with, the, with regards to the powers of entry and search, um, saying that the PSNI have those powers already under pace, but why was the question asked then in the consultation? I think it was probably asked because I think there was a concern that, in fact, stalking was not seen as being as serious an offence. It was perhaps not recognised <clears throat> uh, for what it is. And I think that's been one of the concerns, that uh, it, not all stalking behaviour seemed to fit neatly into harassment le uh, legislation. And they, it, it then became a bit of an anomaly, where the police, I think, perhaps didn't, didn't know either weren't recognising patterns or they weren't seen recognised that they had a power to intervene because it wasn't a clear, there wasn't a clear and obvious serious criminal offence. What we're doing by this, through this legislation is establishing it as actually an offence which can be pursued under indictment where, uh, where it's in a particularly serious form. Uh, that means there's no lack of certainty, so the police are actually quite able to confidently use powers, whereas previously when they were getting some indication, well, someone kept leaving flowers outside my house and, and, I, and I keep seeing them in the street corner, uh, they were actually struggling to say, well, was well, that a serious offence which gave them the power to actually do, to carry out those sort of actions? Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose going back to the, the face of the bill and just the offence then, and um, I know just what I know Paul Frew had raised it with regard to loitering in any place, whether public or private, um, I believe that that is directly in the Scottish legislation um, in 2010 as well. So it certainly would be good to get some clarity if that has been put in there in Scotland uh, for any particular reason and its functions. Um, the course of conduct and that it is in the offensive stalking four or sorry five, um, and it's got a list of a the. A defence for a person charged with a stalking offence to show that the course of the conduct was authorised, first of all, 5A, authorised by virtue of any statutory provision or rule of law. Would you be able to give some of the examples of what that actually means? Okay, you could find a situation that uh, the police were observing someone because of, of sus suspected drug offences. Would be a, an example. You could find that the uh, licensing authorities might be doing some surveying surveillance in the area about actually sort of a, um, a TV licenses. You could find uh, uh, DVLA may have issues about actually vehicle vehicle registration and licensing. There could be a number of quite legitimate reasons that people would actually be calling, and this um, perhaps on a number of occasions. So, in essence, what we we recognise it will be lawful. There will be lawful reason for people uh, um, carrying out carrying out surveillance in some cases. For example, actually social security um, fraud, where you may well find that there will be a surveillance operation to, to pick up some uh, um, the people who actually are abusing uh, the letters, the, the um, uh, losing abusing the benefits or not entitled to them. So there will be a number of factors there. So clearly, in the law, we want to actually exclude those. But, and so if there's a legitimate reason for that. This isn't about legitimate personal reason. This is about a legitimate organisational or business uh, or legal reason for actually that behaviour. Uh, then clearly that would that shouldn't be included in the story. Okay. No, thank you. So we'll probably go into more. Um, certainly, I will. But if that course of conduct, regardless if it's on a statutory provision or rule of law, is causing someone to suffer fear, alarm, or substantial distress, you know that behaviour should be looked at. Um, well, I but suspect were actually, um, if you were actually claiming uh, for benefits you weren't entitled to for a long period, and somebody started looking at it, well, I, it may well cause you some distress to discover that you'll be, you're, you'll be, uh, you're under surveillance. Uh, I'm not sure that being in distress in that situation would actually be stalking. Uh, but clearly, we're talking about where people are, are carrying, carrying out, you know, as you say, fixated, obsessive, uh, unwanted, and repeated behaviour. And that, that acronym is quite useful when you're looking at these, and that should help us to quite clearly exclude those sort of legitimate purposes while not but while they're keeping it in the frame uh, those those obsessive um, people who are con conducting obsessive behaviour uh, and and in the process actually seriously actually sort of damaging victims. Thank you. 
Um, in terms of so you said absence of a legal definition, a great legal definition of stalking, and obviously there isn't one here either. Do you think that that is a gap, or do you think that is okay given the non-exhaustive list of behaviours? I think it's been very hard to establish a legal definition. So in essence, why? What we have given is actually as close as we are able to come while, with, with confidence. Um, we're always happy if you can come up with a, a brilliant legal definition. Um, we're very happy to adopt it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> our, 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 from talking to our colleagues in other parts of the UK and elsewhere, you know, that, that it, trying to, to get a, a definition given that, that this sort of behaviour can, can morph and change in different ways depending on circumstances and opportunity. To try to be comprehensive and actually cover all aspects is problematic. So what we did do is we picked up some of the regular and typical sorts of behaviours, but to put in a test of reasonableness at the end, in terms yeah, of actually a reasonable I, person would, would see it as being an offence. I certainly don't have a ready-made definition for you, um, but I know it's something that has come up before in debate and certainly with in academic research about a lack of legal definition. I know it was brought up with the domestic abuse bill as well. Um, just again, in terms of who this applies to, um, there's no age range in this bill, so this would be applicable, this offence would be applicable for anyone over the age of criminal responsibility? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, um... I don't see why, you know, it is clearly a um, behaviour which actually is, um, would call, cause um, problems. I suspect, uh, I'd be surprised if you find many children actually in this, in this fitting into this category, uh, but clearly um, it, it, could be, it could happen, I presume, at any age. Uh, normally, I think it doesn't tend to be very young or very old people who are involved, but in fact, um, um, uh, I don't think, in fact, we can say that with, with certainty that no, any one group should be excluded. So, in fact, I think we, it's, it really allows anyone who's within the age of criminal responsibility. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I might just add very, very quickly, Rachel, it's Andrew Lovery speaking, that in, in drafting legislation, um, unless there's a specific clause to exclude an age group, then the legislation automatically extends to all age groups. So for it not to include children, there would have to be a clause that said, you know, a person of 18 years or over. Um, and I mean, certainly what our thinking was that we, we certainly don't want to uh, criminalise <coughs> innoxious um, behaviour by young people. But similarly, we don't, miss, we don't want to miss an opportunity for something which is more than just a teenage crush. Um, where someone is in fear or, you know, caused to be in distress or fear for their safety as an adolescent, mm -hmm. either okay. as a victim or as a perpetrator. Um, so I appreciate, I've, I've loads of questions, I'm sure I'll tie it up with you again, but um, in terms of just of the, the comparisons between the um, conviction rates, so at the moment of indictment in Scotland, five years maximum plus fine. Um, England is five years, but consulting on 10 years. Republic of Ireland is seven years plus an uninhibited fine. And we're proposing 10 years plus a fine. Um, is that kind of a roundabout we've just got in comparison to other jurisdictions or is there a reason for the 10 years? Well, we wanted to, we wanted to create a significant uplift from the protection the penalties under the protection from harassment order and 10 years is, is seen as uh, a serious <laughs> conviction yeah. for a serious offence uh, and I think that, that that reflects the seriousness that we attach to the offence and yes there, we obviously have uh, done our, our due diligence in analysing uh, disposals in other jurisdictions um, not, but not only other jurisdictions but also uh, existing offences within our own legislature. Okay, thank you. Finally, Chair, I just want to ask on Clause 5 for a reason of why there would be no right to claim trial by jury. Uh, this is where someone is being tried in a magistrate's court. Um, the maximum sentence of imprisonment that can typically be imposed without a jury trial is six months. So by uplifting the maximum penalty for uh, conviction on summary, uh, conviction to 12 months um, imprisonment, that's 
uh, a consequential amendment that we have to make in order for that the person not to be able to claim uh, a jury trial in that instance. Okay. Okay, Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda, you had a, a brief question just to follow up on. Can you hear me, Chair? Yep, we can hear you now, yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. It, just on, on the back of of a question that was asked earlier, in relation to the protection orders, um, again, as I talked about earlier about the training, I think this is another issue where reporting will be essential because while she've said that obviously there are quite serious consequences for not abiding by a protection order, the difficulty is will judges actually impose those um, in, in terms of the five years and, and, and the, the, the serious implications for those who are guilty of, of breaking these. So I think that we do need some kind of a reporting mechanism in there because if people are continuously breaking these, but whenever they go to court, the judge is not, I suppose, making them be held accountable in, in terms of potentially, you know, imposing prison sentences, then we need to be aware of that. We need to know that now. There's no value in having it unless it's actually used. I th think the necessity is that five years is the maximum uh, sentence yeah. for that offence. And clearly, you, you, could have, you could have a range of breaches. You know, if someone is deliberately breaching the order, actually, and uh, repeatedly, that's one thing. If it happened once uh, on one occasion in a very minor sort of way, or, um, that, that would be, you know, but clearly you need to have to give judges discretion. Having said that, that's something which we clearly could keep up, we could keep um, under review, and certainly we could see how it how it was working in practice. But our dilemma is once you know, setting a five year sentence is a message to judiciary that this is a serious offence. You know, and, and if it's got, if it's five years, it's gone in indictment. So the public, public prosecution service has, has concluded it's sufficiently serious not to put it to a magistrate's court, but to put it to the, to the crown court. So the expectation is, in fact, the judges will actually act accordingly. And if it's a five-year sentence, the range, the top of the range is five years. So in fact, it would be much different if it was a six-month sentence. So I think it's one we can watch. At the same time, I am very conscious as a department that, um, is that, that the judiciary, once we actually set the range of, of, of our penalties, we, we have to recognise the independence of the judiciary and its capacity to look at all the facts in a case and make a judgment. And that Brent, Brent, to be independent of the, of the political domain. Brian, I, 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 sorry, Chair, if I can just quickly come back in. I absolutely accept what you're saying, and, and I'm 100% for for the that independence of the judiciary, and they should be doing their job. I just think the reporting's important because we need to know if something's working. And I think within that reporting, you can you can allow for the fact that, of course, there are very different circumstances as to why somebody would get, you know, two months or a fine over and above somebody who would potentially get five years. But I do think there has to be some type of reporting mechanism because of, as we've seen through the Gillen review and other reviews, that just because something is available to the courts doesn't mean that it's maybe used in the best use, I suppose, for the, the victims and those who are, are sufferers of, of the crime and we're well aware in terms of particularly around sexual violence. Um, that the, the law did not work for for those who were victims and 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 that's clear to be seen in terms of the the uphill battle we now have with trying to get people to report those type of of crimes so i just think it's important that we don't wait until years down the line and have another gillen review or whoever the judge happens to be at that time you know in, in 20 or 30 years time i want to know that it's working in two years time and four years time you know and, and the reporting will even be as you know, part of it will be just how many people are actually breaking the I condition. I, it's I it's all. I can guarantee that we will actually put. We will actually make sure there's a monitoring arrangement. So, in fact, our normal statistics will pick this up, and it's something which we will review, uh, as we as we would do in these sort of cases anyway. We will re review periodically. You know, knowing it's working, it's always actually more complex. But if we can know the numbers, and that's that's mm -hmm. quite straightforward. But if you find that X, you know, percentage have actually had a certain sense of why a longer sentence, you know, then the question is, is that, you know, getting going below that is actually quite complex. Uh, but certainly, I think we can certainly actually um, report on the numbers, numbers of numbers of instances of 
both of orders being laid and of breaches and, and, and the consequences of those breaches. That's something which could, could certainly be done. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair. That's, that's everything. Okay, thank you, Mandic. Paul Free. Yeah, a very quick one, Brian. See the, the list of conducts. Have you considered adding into that the creation of a picture wall or shrine like type decoration whereby you, you you know you see it whereby you go into somebody's room and there's it's decorated by pictures of the victim uh, that might be a manifestation as much as a conduct but it would tie in with the watching and spying and also the monitoring of of the internet uh, but I think in itself could it be classed as a conduct yeah. I, mean, I think in fact um yes i think it's certainly to start with, in fact, the police actually have found, had um, seen a pattern emerging and they felt that they needed to go into a person's house to actually to look for evidence. I think finding a wall of, of pictures taken uh, um, without the permission of the, of the individual um, would, would certainly be a strong indicator of, of obsessive behaviour and also of invasion of their privacy. So I would have thought that would be material evidence which they would take on board, absolutely. Uh, but certainly, it's also back to your what well, a reasonable person uh, would, would consider to, um, um, would, it, would it consider to be um, um, stalking. And I think no reasonable person seeing uh, a stranger having a whole wall of pictures of someone they've taken um, without any sort of uh, permission or authority. Um, they, there's no way they. I think that would be seen by most reasonable people as being certainly seriously so worrying behaviour. And certainly taken with other things, I'm sure it would it would certainly um, strengthen the case against them. So in that, should it not be listed and itemised on page two? I think, in fact, the truth is, you know, nowadays, to start with, actually, a picture wall is more, much more likely that if you, when the police have access to a person's computer, they'll find all the pictures on the computer rather than on the wall. So I think ultimately it's what you're looking for is evidence of, of, of the behaviour, and that would be evidence. I don't think we, in, every, in instances in the Act, we want to necessarily cite what every, what every item of evidence might constitute. We're talking about behaviours. Now that behaviour clearly was actually one of taking photographs, uh, obsessively taking photographs of an individual without uh, uh, authority. Um, that um, certainly could be included, but the truth is, in fact, you know, as I think Andy said, this is quite a comprehensive list, but it's not an exhaustive one. You know, we could no doubt add um, things to it. It's been put together looking at what's happened in Scotland. It's gone past our, our expert group, which brought in the, uh, the victims groups. Uh, and we thought it was reasonable, but at the same time, in fact, there were probably other things you could, you could put in. But, um, but I think the list as it stands, taken with the, the, uh, that, that test of reasonableness at the end, uh, I think probably is sufficient. Okay, thank you. Okay. So if no other members need any more clarity on that, then can I thank the officials for uh, attending the committee meeting today? That's much appreciated, as always. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Okay, members. Um, obviously, this is uh, indicating our contentment for the principles of the bill. Um, uh, I have no doubt we'll spend a lot more time debating now all of the detail in it um, at the the committee scrutiny stage. So, our members content to support the general principles that are contained within the bill, and then I can reflect that at the uh, appropriate stage. Uh, for the second stage debate in the bill on behalf of the committee. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. We're all agreed. Um, if members are content, we'll ask the department for a list of the organisations uh, that had responded to its consultation so that we have that information. Um, item 5, then, on the agenda is the Criminal Justice uh, Reform Bill. The closing date for written evidence on the Committal Reform Bill was last Friday and a total of 14 written submissions have been received and the police service in Niagara had requested a short extension to that time scale. The police um, submission has now been received and Niagara have indicated that it uh, does not intend to submit written evidence on the bill. So members, an electronic bill folder has been set up for the written submissions and all other relevant bill papers. 
It can be accessed via the SharePoint or the link in the email that was sent to members uh, yesterday, and members will then be advised when any new material is added to the bill folder. It's normal practice to put the written submissions on the committee bill web page, and it's also proposed that correspondence and information provided by the department on the bill is also placed on the web pages to provide access for key stakeholders and interested uh, individuals. So if members are content, we will place both the written submission from organisations and the Department of Justice briefing papers and correspondence on the committee bill web page. Members are agreed. Yes, content. Um, the meetings of the 4th of February and 11th of February are currently being held for oral evidence sessions in respect of this bill. The most substantive comments um, have been received by the Bar of Northern Ireland, the Law Society and the Public Prosecution Service. Um, so I would be proposing to the committee that we would uh, organise for those three organisations to provide us evidence and uh, subsequent to that, um, if it's felt necessary to take oral evidence from um, another organisation, we can do that. But these are the three primary organisations that provided the most substantive uh, submissions. Are members content that we organise for those three organisations for oral briefing, and then following that, we can consider if it's necessary for any other organisations? Members agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, item six is an amendment to the uh, Criminal Justice Rules 2009. Um, so I just wanted to walk walk this issue through with members. Um, the department is proposing to make a statutory rule to amend the Criminal Justice Sentencing Licensing Conditions Northern Ireland Rules 2009. And the propose the purpose of the rule is to allow the department to designate organisations other than the probation board to supervise offenders on licence who pose a risk of serious harm to the public. That statutory responsibility for managing offenders on licence currently rests solely with the probation board. An operational change approved by the Minister in September um, last year drew together the PSNI, Probation Service, Prison Service, Public Protection Officials and the Department to work closely to assess and manage the risk posed by terrorist-related offenders. This was an interim measure to support the development of a new model for managing this type of offender. A leading academic was commissioned to develop a bespoke risk assessment tool for use within Northern Ireland, which can be used to determine licence conditions and may help inform parole review panels to determine if an individual may be safely released on licence. The Department stating that it has concluded a multi-agency arrangement uh, to be the most appropriate approach for monitoring uh, the terrorist-related offenders that are on licence. An amendment to legislation is required for the new model to provide the depart Department with discretion to assign the lead statutory responsibility for the management of TROs on licence to a body other than the Probation Board. The legislation will not specify who will perform that role. The Department intends to establish a specialised multi-agency team led by counter-terrorism offender managers trained in using the bespoke risk assessment tool. A business case for the new delivery model is being developed, and there is currently no funding in place to cover the annual running costs of a new model. Uh, an indicative bid um, was included in the financial uh, planning exercise. So, members, for your information, the committee has not previously been provided with any of the information on the development of the new model for managing TROs for which this proposed statutory rule is required. A number of other, uh, other areas for further consideration is set out in paragraph 7 of the Senior Assistant Clerk's memo. That is on page 124 of the meeting pack, uh, and members may have their own queries on this. So, Members, we may want to then uh, explore these issues further before reaching a position on the statutory rule. Um, so hopefully that has clarified this particular issue um, in terms of the statutory rule in effect gives the power to make these changes, but we haven't been provided with the information as to what exactly this new model would be, um, the financial resources that would be needed for it. It's my view that we should request an, an oral briefing session from officials in order to get this level of information, because the statutory rule is by way of a negative resolution procedure, which obviously gives you less ability to raise issues even on the floor of the Assembly. So 
If members are content, we will schedule an oral briefing session with officials um, to explore these matters further before we would consider our approval or otherwise of the statutory rule request. Um, Sinead Bradley. Yes, sorry, Chair, I sort of jumped in maybe too early. I just say that the, you know the clerk's paper is quite um, detailed on that and has raised a lot of the questions that I would certainly like to ask, but I really haven't been able to find anywhere why it's proposed the legislation would be silent um, and even referencing the body that they're trying to create that cross-body agency. Um, so yes, a briefing session would be really helpful to get to some of that detail. Thank you. Okay. Well, listen, members, if we're content, then we will ask the department to uh, schedule an oral briefing session with us on this, and that'll give us an opportunity to consider the matter further. Okay, members, we're agreed. Item seven, then. This is the new legal framework for setting personal injury discount rate issue. At our meeting last week, the committee noted further information from the department on the proposals for a new legal framework for setting the personal injury discount rate and a response from the Minister of Finance regarding access to the reserve should the proposals result in a budget pressure. The committee agreed to consider the issue further when a response was available from the department to its letter requesting an update on the position on setting an interim rate in light of a legal challenge and the committee's discussions on the issue at the meeting on the 3rd of December. The department has written confirming the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers uh, set out its concerns regarding the decision not to set a new rate in a pre-action judicial review letter. The department responded, setting out the reasons for the permanent secretary's decision and intends to defend any application for judicial review of the decision. It is also confirmed that the permanent secretary does not intend to review his decision at this time, but is keeping the matter under review, with particular reference to how quickly the proposed bill to change the legal framework to set the rate progresses. The minister has also uh, written to the committee advising that a submission is being made to the executive seeking agreement to introduce the damages uh, bill and for it to be proceeded through the accelerated passage process. The Minister is hoping that this uh, item will be considered by the Executive at its meeting on the 4th of February, and uh, she wishes to reflect the Committee's view uh, at that meeting and has requested an opportunity to brief the Committee on her reasons for seeking accelerated passage, uh, either at our meeting on <coughs> Thursday the 28th or Tuesday the 2nd, 20th of January or Tuesday the 2nd of February. Uh, the Department has written separately, providing an overview of the key provisions in the Bill, a copy of the Draft Bill and the EFM, which has been provided on an in-confidence basis. The Department's paper also sets out information on the reasons for seeking accelerated passage. So, Following the oral evidence session on the 3rd of December, the Committee agreed to advise the Department that it had not been persuaded at the time by the information provided uh, that the legislation to introduce the new legal framework for setting the personal injury discount rate should proceed by way of accelerated passage, but that it was willing to engage and discuss a legislative timeline with the Department to progress the legislation before the end of the mandate. The Committee also agreed that it would require further engagement with key stakeholders and Department uh, before reaching a decision on whether it supports the Department's policy approach of adopting the Scottish model in relation to a new framework. So, members, that's the updated position as to where we currently stand on this issue. Um, I was going to suggest to members that we schedule the minister um, for the normal committee meeting on Thursday, the 29th of January, in order for her to outline her position around accelerated uh, passage. In doing so, we will reschedule the stock take of placing oversight um, session uh, to accommodate. The minister coming to the committee, and at that stage, um, members will be able to quiz the the minister and express a position in respect of the matter. Unless members are wanting to to raise any issues now in advance of that. Okay, so members, we will pick this up when the minister comes to the committee meeting then on Thursday, the eighth of January. Okay, agreed. Um. Item 9, then, is uh, <coughs> item nine's correspondence. Sorry, there's eight items of correspondence. Um, I'm just going to draw attention to two of them. There's a response from the Minister to the Committee's request for further information on whether any of the recommendations from the inquiry into the hyponatremia-related deaths fall within the uh, remit and response. Sorry, I can't hear. There's a mic being muted somewhere. Mm. OK, 
Okay. Neither can I. Okay, I just I can hear a little bit. But of I thought it was just me. I think it's your connection, chair. There's maybe a little bit of circular feedback coming around this room. I'm not honestly sure because I could hear myself a little bit on the speaker system. So I'm not sure. I'll try again um, and hopefully members can pick me up if I go a little bit slower. <laughs> Sounds rather robotic. Um, are members able to hear me okay now? No, you're right. I thought it was my connection, but I think it's yours. Sorry, sir, I can't hear. This other mic's up on at the same time, override you intermittently. Sorry. Okay, well, um, I'll have to see. Maybe the broadcasting folks have had a chance just to fix that. Okay. I didn't do anything, so um, there's obviously some gremlins floating about. The two items of correspondence that I just wanted to draw attention to, members, um, one is the response from the Minister in terms of the Committee's request around the recommendations in the hyponatremia-related deaths and what um, recommendations fall to the Department of Justice by way of its responsibility. Um, the Department has outlined that it is represented by the Coroner Service on a number of subgroups for the Death Certificate Implementation Working Group. That relates to the work stream, uh, work stream number two. Additionally, the Coroner Service medical advisors have worked closely with the Independent Medical Examiner subgroup and provided significant support in the implementation of a recent IME pilot scheme, which has been reviewing deaths in the hospital setting on a part-time basis. The pilot is ongoing and results are likely to be discussed in early 2021. The department has offered a further update on the coron coroner's service contribution um, to the IME pilot, so it would be helpful, I think, if we had an update on that. Uh, the, the one key recommendation that I would like the committee to go back to the Department of Justice. Within that report, it spoke about placing a duty of candour upon individual medical professionals, but attached to that would be a criminal sanction. Uh, and that is a specific recommendation that I'm keen to find out is the Department of Justice um, engaged upon in terms of the Department of Health looking at these recommendations. So if members are content, um, we'll write back specifically asking um, for an update on that uh, particular recommendation. Okay, then finally for me, correspondence from uh, BAS, BASC and the Northern Ireland Firearms Dealers highlighting their shared concerns in respect of a new policy from the PSNI Firearms and Explosives Branch um, requiring firearms certificate holders to apply for additional firearms magazines and to pay a £30 application fee for doing so, which um, they believe to be unnecessary and unfair. So, if members are content, we will just forward that correspondence to DOJ for a response to the issues being raised, and then we may wish to pick that up um, upon receipt of the response. Are members content to action then the rest of the correspondence as outlined in the clerk's memo? Agreed. Agreed. Chair. Uh, Rachel Woods. Thanks, Chair. So just with regard to the BASC letter, um, if possible, I'm not too sure if we can, but can, can we clarify with the PSNI with regard to the change of policy on the online purchase of firearms and ammunition, which they said previously said online purchases were illegal, um, when that changed and what, you know, what was the process behind that? Yep. Yeah, um happy for that to be included in it. It's one that I've spoken to a number of people on just to, to get my understanding off. And I know it is an issue that firearms dealers, for example, have raised with me. Um, the, the change, this change, um, they're finding quite strange because there are restrictions upon them by way of what they can hold within their facilities by way of stock. And now there's this online ability has been created to, to bring in things. So I suspect indi individual firearms holders are probably reasonably content with this change. Um, but firearms dealers are asking if we're 
restricted from holding certain levels of stock, um, how come now people are able to access online in an unrestricted manner? And, and that's something that I'd be happy to get a little bit more understanding about myself from the firearms branch. So we can write to the, the, the place about that. Yes, Linda. Uh, there, there's a bit uh, the connection isn't great at the minute but just to, to to clarify on this i think maybe there would be more value in writing to the chief constable rather than doj because it looks like it's a psna operational issue or internal issue and i just think rather than going around the houses forwarding it to doj who'll come back and say it's not under their responsibility and just put the questions directly to the chief constable in a letter would probably be the easier way to get around it yeah Okay, well, I'm happy to do that, if members are content. Chair, while we are adding to the substance of the letter, can I um, maybe throw another piece in there? Um, there are firearm holders who have now have to renew their licence online, and some had expressed having difficulty in doing that. And I wonder if we could get an update then on the stats of how many firearm holders there were um, prior to that change and that requirement to have to renew online and how many have been renewed online. I'm just wondering, are there firearms out there where they've just been knocked away in a cabinet because they couldn't um, engage in the process? It might be a time to do it. Thank you. Okay. That's fine. We'll, we'll add that into the letter. Okay. Well, then we'll action the rest of the correspondence as outlined in the memos. Clerk, I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business members want to raise? If there's no other business, then we will meet again next Thursday at 2 o'clock, and that'll be in room 30, and then obviously via the Starleaf facility for members and witnesses as well. Okay, um, thank you, members. Um, meeting adjourned. Thank you, thank you Chair. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.